Hello guys, I'm back from a long YouTube break. Uh, you know, getting zero views on a video isn't exactly a catalyst for motivation. So, instead, I decided to make two more chessboards in Minecraft. Because, you know, I, I was bored. So, the reason I decided to make these chessboards is because the first chessboard, which I showcased in my other video, was simply too slow. I decided to host a tournament on it, and I had to cut it short because the games just took way too long. Because moving a piece took, like, anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute, usually. So I decided to make another chessboard, and then that chessboard was slow. So I decided to make a third chessboard in a single-player world. So today I'm going to uh, try and explain how it works, and maybe do a demonstration. So this is what the chessboard looks like. I'll do a little bit of a flyby. So that you can see all the inner workings. Nice, 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 nice. Here, I'll do an aerial view. So what this system has over other chessboards that I've seen uh, is mainly the space between the squares. In most other chessboards, you would have like six blocks between each display. But this one only has two. And it's very compact in terms of display. Um, and it's fast enough. It's competitively fast. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it competes with... Yeah, that was a horrible word to use. But it competes with the other chess boards that I've seen. It doesn't have um, rules coded in. So you just have to trust that your friend doesn't cheat. So to explain um, all of the parts of the system, I'm going to go down the list of this color purpose indicator, which um, is just describing what each color in the system does and what uh, each line is dedicated to. Um, so we'll start with the input. So with the input, I wanted the input system to look something like this with an array of buttons. And the first button you press being the uh, piece you want to move, and the second button you press being the square you move it to. Uh, so the original problem, and I've already explained this on the first chessboard video because I used this system with that too, but this is an improved version so I'll still explain it again. Um, to When you press a square, I need the system to know um, what file and what rank that square is. In ranks and files, ranks are just rows and files are columns. So uh, if I press C5, I want the system to know that I pressed um, I pressed a button on the fifth rank and in the C file. And once it combines that information, it knows I pressed C5. So the lime um, line here is transferring data about the file, sorry, the rank, and the magenta is transferring data about the file. And then it uses that information to select a square. So how does it figure out? what the file and rank are based on what you pressed. Uh, well, I set up a demonstration over here to help me explain it better. So for example, uh, this is uh, rank one, two, three, four, five, and file A, B, C, D, E, that way. So um, let's say I pressed uh, E3. Um, this is what it would look like underneath. And to find the rank, you just take the difference between these two comparator outputs, these two corners, uh, as you can see, uh, it's, I think this is 6 and 9. So it takes the difference between 6 and 9, which is 3, and outputs 3. And 3 happens to correspond with rank 3. I mean, that doesn't always happen. That was a whole book example. Let's try this. So if I were to press E2, uh, now the rank's changed, and now it's 5. Um, and so you can see here that even if I move the rest of the block over here, the difference is still 5, because you increase 1 to both of these parameters, so the difference doesn't change. But if I move it across, the distance starts to change, the difference starts to change, and you see this number decrease, and then on the other side start increasing, and then uh, all the way up to 7. As you can see, you can move this all the way back, it's still going to be 7. Okay. And then you just use the same logic but rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, for file selection, and that's basically how it how it works. 
So uh, the next part I want to explain is yeah, once the information actually gets there, what does it do? So it uses um, instant repeaters to send the information. So this this so all this signal transfer is instantaneous, which really helps with timing. I don't have to worry about timing as much. I still do, but not as much. So when the information gets here, it will um, so it'll decrease the signal strength by one every time it climbs up or down and uh, for example like you saw that rank 8 is 7 so it takes longer or actually I think it's decreased by 2 because it's by 2 but whatever um decreases by 2 to get up here um, and then only uh, what the system does is it only outputs a signal uh, which in this case the line turns off when it's selected if the signal strength is exactly 1 if it's more than 1 then this will turn off Sorry, this will turn on. If it's more than one, this will turn on. And if it's less than one, this will stay on. So that's how that works. Um, and for example, let me just pretend that I selected um, A8. Um, so this, ha this happens for the rank and the file. And it only will... Um, these torches will only turn on when both the file for that square and the rank of that square are selected. Because if I select C5, then the entire fifth rank will turn off. The entire fifth rank will be selected, and the entire C file will be selected. But I only want C5 to be selected, which means I, I need to only select the square where both of those systems land. So um, to explain that better, if this system turns off, it won't select every square in that row, it'll only select the square where the purple or magenta line also turns off because they're both powering the redstone torch. So for example, this line will turn off and this line will turn off, causing this gray line to turn off, which will turn on these torches. And what happens when the torches turn on is it detects things about the square, which I'll explain later sends that information to this system, which I'll also explain later. Um, but the more important thing is how it is the display, which I think. So I use binary to transmit the signals about what piece is being held. Like if you select a piece, the system needs to know what piece you selected, what type of piece, whether it's a knight or a black king or a white rook or something. It needs to know. So I gave each... Um, piece a code, a binary code, um, and a number based on, I mean, it was arbitrary, honestly, but it makes some sort of sense. A pawn is 1, or 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, in this case, it's a, this is a black pawn, so it's 0, 1, 1, 1, which is a black pawn, and the number is 7. Uh, so this white system here is actually converting um, a binary code into a number that can be read by this system. Um, so what it's, what it's doing here with all these comparators on subtract mode is it's doing 15 minus 8 minus 7 minus, uh, sorry, 15 minus 8 minus 4 minus 2 minus 1. And, um, but that only happens when all of these are activated. Let me find another one where, that, where that's true. Yeah, so all of these are up, which means um, these comparators are taking signals from these lecterns, which means they are subtracting from this total. So 15 minus 8 minus 4 minus 2 minus 1, which is 0. Um, and if you go up here, these three bits are activated, which means it's just, do it's just doing 15 minus 8, which is 7, which happens to correspond to the binary code. And if I go up, up again, uh, this is doing, yeah, this is doing 15 minus 4 minus 2, which is 9. Wait, is that 9? Yes. It, which is 9, uh, which is the code for a black knight. And if we follow this square, the, there's a black knight on this square. On B8. Yep. So, um, I'm going to take a second to explain how it converts a number into um, a piece on a square. So this is the display system. And this I had to get really creative for. Um... Because I need to be able to do a detailed pixel-specific display. So most displays that have that are like vertical like this, 
you can you, you can only activate two by two pixels at a time. But using this memory system here, I can activate one pixel at a time. Um, and how it does that, because normally you wouldn't be able to um, power one one pixel at a time. Um, but I can have them in an array by sending observers into a into a loop. So this observer will detect this observer firing, and which will detect this observer firing. And since redstone lamps take longer to turn off than they do turn on, this redstone lamp appears as, as if it's being constantly powered. Um, but it's still a, an issue when this appears to power individual lamps in, a, in an array. So I created this system, which um, I haven't seen anywhere else. This is completely new as far as I know. That can take um, any, it uses a sort of its own memory. Um, in this case, there's 12 pieces. So there's 12 of these uh, little modules, individual modules here that each correspond to their own piece. So for example, if this comparator were to activate, it would activate all of the uh, required pixels for a Black King. Um, so how does it do that? I'm going to go into spectator mode for this. So um, when this activates, this observer will fire all of these pistons and this entire slate, like this entire plate will move down. This observer will fire and move the plate back up. And so all the observers directly attached to this plate will fire. But as you can see, the only ones where there's observers directly attached are the squares that need to be lit up for a black king. All the other squares that are empty are um, hoppers. And those are activated when an observer from behind powers this, but there's nothing being activated from behind it, so those don't activate. But what that allows is, for example, if I were to move this slate, um, then I can send signals through other plates. Um, but how do you do that if you don't have an observer there? You, sorry, if you have an observer there instead of a hopper, you can't power an observer. You have to have the observer detect something. So I use this wall. Um, the observer will power this trapdoor. Uh, let me get out of spectator mode. This observer will power this trapdoor, flipping it up um, and changing the orientation of this wall. And the observer will detect that and make it a pixel signal. And... Same thing for this, but this is a one tick pulse, so it'll just send it all the way through. Um, that's just of how it works. But you might notice that if I have one of these for every single square, there's no way I can fit them in an array because the next square, the pistons would have to overlap if they're going to be two apart. Um, they're going to be two apart, so that won't work. So this is actually the module for a dark square, and the light squares have a different module which is the same, but the pistons push across instead of up and down. That allows me to put pistons here, for example. And now it will actually fit. So that's um, the gist of how that works. Uh, and I'll explain how this works briefly. If you have a signal strength of, for example, four, and you send it through the system, uh, this signal strength of four will come through. It'll decrease by one, thanks to these. Um, it'll decrease by one for every single module that it goes. And every time it decreases, you have a system that detects whether it's equal to one. Right here, it's equal to one. It powers this comparator, but it doesn't power this repeater, which would prevent the comparator from lighting up. Um, and over here, you have an, a system, and if it's zero, it won't power in the first place. If it's, if it's more than one, that it won't power because the repeater will stop it from being powered. But if it lights up, the observer will detect it, move this slate, and power the screen. In this case, uh, four is a rook. So yeah, if it turns off, the observer will detect it again and activate the same pixels, which turns the same pixels off. So it actually works out pretty pretty nicely. So that's the gist of how the display system works. Um, now I can move on to this system, which is transmitting the data to a central point, and telling the other squares what to print when you select the next square. If these are pushed down, meaning that they're um, they're part of the bit, and this special torch turns on, it'll power these powered rails. So, for example, um, a knight, a black knight, 
is 1, 0, 0, 1, which means these two bits will activate when the square is selected. If, it's co if, this, if the square is selected with a knight on it, it'll activate these. So these observers will activate, powering these lines, which will activate these instant repeaters, and send a signal all the way up to a central place, uh, which is this. So these pistons will have moved these two bits and also attaches to this wall, which sends an instant signal all the way down, which this observer detects and activates these two bits. And now these bits are sent back through the system. And this system to the right sends that information to every single square. So this is basically sending all that information from the central point to every single square. And now every square knows what to print on that square when the next, um, when it's selected. So basically, yeah, all these are selected. These are turned off. And these are turned on. So uh, when the next square is selected, this redstone torch will turn off. And um, these droppers will only turn off if there if it's not being powered by something else because when this turns off um this will turn off this won't turn off because it's still being powered by these torches and this will turn off and that will that's what prints the thing on the square uh, and it also resets what's what's already there first so that it's it's not doing weird things because if it activated now it would be that would uh, fire and this would fire and that's not even a piece so all right, the next thing I should talk about uh, is this purple line. Um, as you can see over here, purple is used for selection mode. So you need two different types of selection. There's one selection for picking up a piece, and there's one for placing a piece. And they're slightly different in terms of how the system um, treats them. So if I were to press this button, uh, it would activate this, and it would toggle it, and this redstone block would, would go here. Um, and that will turn off this entire system, telling the system that it's in pick up a piece mode. Or I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's picking up a piece. And the only difference really is up here, where when um, the system places a piece, it's going to reset whatever's in here. In fact, I didn't reset this myself. Let me just do that. So when the system tries to place a piece down, it's still going to take information from that square, but it doesn't want to. So it's going to reset uh, whatever's stored in here because you don't have a piece held anymore. Uh, the next system that I should explain is probably input timing, and then I'll go to pawn promotion. So um, to make it easier, uh, because right now the, uh, the input timing is you should, uh, in fact, this is the first time I've demonstrated it. Let me do that. You need to wait for the button to come up. Um, it's very lenient though. You wait for the button to come up before pressing your second button. And as you can see, we moved a pawn from E2 to E4. Um, so yeah, the timing, basically you wait a second after pressing your first input to press your second input. Uh, and then you shouldn't move another piece until the piece lights up. Although, I mean, I, I don't know what the specifics of how fast you can do it are, but that's just the rule of thumb. The, the only way for this to really work, basically it makes it more lenient, this red line makes um, makes the button timing much more lenient because it will stop um, the signal that's coming out of this comparator after five ticks, I think, or some amount of time. Uh, it'll stop that coming through. So really, it turns the one second or ten tick pulse from a normal, red, uh, from a normal button into a five tick pulse. Uh, and that allows you to press buttons more quickly, and it makes the system more lenient. Um, and also for pawn promotion, it will block signals exiting so that you can select the piece, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So, say for example, your pawn gets to the end of the board, and you want to promote a piece from a pawn to a queen, or a rook, or a knight. So the way it handles this, is this is a system here that detects whether there's a pawn carried or in the system. Um, and it knows that because, uh, for example, if I have, uh, this is the signal for a, um, the binary code for a pawn. 
a white pawn. As you can see, all of these um, are turned off. That's turned off, that's turned off, that's turned off, that's turned off. And if this redstone torch were turned off, this line right here would turn off, which would turn this on and activate the system that starts promoting a pawn. But this needs to turn off, and what is this? This is the system that detects what rank you've selected. Um, and you can only promote a pawn on the 8th rank, so when the 8th rank is activated and you have a pawn selected, this system will activate and start promoting your pawn. So it will uh, it'll give you a little bit of a demonstration of how that would work in a real game. So I'm going to move the pawn I just moved, so from E4 all the way to the end of the board, because you know I didn't I did put rules in this system. You can just move a piece anywhere you want. E4 to the end of the board. So now it knows that I need to promote a pawn. These lights will start flashing, and it wants me to select a piece to promote my pawn to, and I'm going to promote to a rook. So I'm going to fly up there. So, the, it'll become a pawn, the pawn will disappear, and turn into a rook. There we go. So that's basically how the pawn promotion system works. Um, oh, and it works for black pawns. Uh, the system has a way of detecting, and I'll show you in a second, uh, whether it's a black pawn, and then turns it into the corresponding piece. So let's do this. D2 to D... Wait, that's D7 to D1. So this pawn will head all the way to the bottom, uh, and it's going to prompt me to select a piece. I'll do a bishop, and now this will turn in from a black pawn to a black bishop. There we go, okay. Um, and I'll briefly explain how that works too. So when you select a piece, it will send that information through this wire. Uh, for example, uh, light light blue terracotta is for bishop, uh, knight, rook, queen. And it'll send that information. One of these lines will activate based on which piece you pressed. And then up here, um, this redstone torch will turn off. Uh, in fact, it basically just powers both of these blocks. But only one of them is a solid block. Uh, and that's based on whether it's a black piece or a white piece. So the black piece... If it's black piece, I think it's set to black right now because I've color coded them based on the rails here. It'll activate this entire rail system, and all these observers will detect them. And this is sort of a memory: black bishop is one zero zero zero, and white bishop is zero zero one zero. So you can kind of see how that works. Um, and it'll activate these lines, which correspond to each bit zero 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 zero. So this will activate. Uh, for example, if I select black bishop, it'll be 1000. This line will activate for a tick, which will trigger this, which will go into the system of what piece is being held. And then the system down here will retrieve whatever in information uh, about the square you just pressed. So it knows it's on the 8th rank or the 1st rank based on, based on um, whether it's a black pawn or a white pawn. But it doesn't know what file. It could be D8, C8, E8. So that's what this information is for. It will release this information, which is stored from the, your original button press, and will release it back, and basically select the square again. Which will, um, after you select the square again, it will place the piece based on what you have held. And because of that system, it knows you have a black bishop held, and it will place the black bishop on that square. So that, that was kind of a mouthful. Hopefully you at least understood a little bit. Um, that, I think that's all pawn promotion done. So I'm going to move on to castling, which was the next thing I worked on. So anything in pink here is castling, which you can see is kind of, it, it was kind of a pain. So in my uh, old system, there was just no castling at all. You had to move the king and then move the rook behind the king in two separate moves. Uh, and in the second chessboard I made, which I, I haven't shown you yet, uh, you also had to move the king two squares and then move the rook as a separate move. But in this chessboard, it does that automatically. So you, all you have to do to castle is move the king two squares, uh, and I'll do that here, e1 to g1. Um, and the king will move, and uh, the pink system will detect that the king's moved two squares from this original point. And then artificially put inputs into the system. Sorry, that moves the rook. There you go. 
Uh, normally there would have to be space between the king and the rook, but no rules. You can do whatever you want. If the king were to move and then move back to the same spot, you can't castle anymore. And if it were to just move to g1, not from e1, but from another square around it, then it also wouldn't trigger castling. So it works perfectly in a, in a game. Um, so you can also uh, queenside castle to the other way. Um, in fact, you know, I'll just show you that right now. So I was going to wait to show you board, uh, board reset, but this is what happens when you reset the board. It's going to clear every square and then manually print on the pieces that are supposed to be there. So like on e7, it'll print upon. So it takes a little bit of time. But then you'll see the entire board wipe. And place a piece, and now the entire board is reset. And that works with any position. Okay, so I'm going to castle this way, just to show you how that works. And I'm going to do it for the, the black king this time. So, e8 to c8. And if you fly up here, the king will move from e8 to c8. Then the rook will move from a8 to d8 there you go and i'll also show you what happens if you move the king so if i move the king from e1 to f1 like this and then next move i move the king from f1 to g1 it won't trigger the castling so the rook won't move because if you were to do that in a game the rook wouldn't move like you you would you can't castle from this position so F1, G1, the king will move, but the rook won't move. So, that's the gist of the castling system. And there is one more system that I would like to explain, which is this one. Uh, piece placing. So, uh, let me just demonstrate real quick. Let's say I wanted to place a knight. Let's say I want to place a black knight on C5. Because, for example, I uh, decided to move a pe to take a knight that was already there, and I can't undo the move because if I move the piece back, then that square will be empty. So you can manually place a piece there. If I press C5 now that I have this lamp turned on. It will place a knight on C5, and it does take a second. There you go. Knight on c5. And this works, it'll override a piece. For example, um, if I place a knight on e7, let's do a white knight this time. So, white knight on e7, then it will delete that pawn and then place a white knight there. So, you can place pieces on top of other pieces, it'll just capture them. There you go. Um, and that's basically it. Um, I do want to briefly explain in more detail the reset system because that's pretty important. You do need to be able to reset a board because it's a pain to do that otherwise. So press reset and I will follow this. Okay, so the first thing the reset system does is it goes through every single line um, and it will clear all of uh, what this is doing here. It's clearing all of the data that's already stored in the piece. So basically, it's going to, at first, clear every square so that it's all blank. But that's not what you want. You want pieces to be placed in their um, correct spots. So after it does that, uh, there's a system that powers uh, this one right here. Every single um, bit that needs to be powered to place a piece on that square. So in this case, there's supposed to be a rook here. Uh, so 0, 1, 0, 0, that's 4, and a rook is 4, so there's a rook here. So it'll clear everything, and then this observer will detect uh, this chain of repeaters firing, and power this piston here. As you can see, that happened. And now this system is doing 15 minus 8 minus 2 minus 1, and that's 4, and it's powering... Uh, the display system here, which is creating a rook. And that's basically how the reset system works. And it's resetting every other system that would have activated too, like the castling system and um, the, the system 
and the purple line. Basically, I'm just going to play a, um, a mock game to demonstrate. So I'll start with uh, just a couple moves. Oh, and it, it is kind of annoying because you do have to like fly up to the board after because Minecraft doesn't like to render updates. Uh, for example, if I do, if I move the knight, you'll probably see a knight on C6 before you see the knight disappear because the the game doesn't like to render. See that 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 was just that had already disappeared a while ago, but the game didn't update it because I wasn't close enough. Which is stupid in my opinion, but it's fine. Um, but I've got used to flying up there every time I press a button. We'll only just move that bishop out to there. Anyway, this took me like two months to make. It was a lot of effort, especially this piece placing thing. It was kind of a pain. Um, but I'm I'm pretty proud of it. It's it's taken a lot of work and time and. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe, hit the like button, so this can be known on the Redstone community. Anyway, uh, goodbye. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Smash like, subscribe. Okay, bye.